Good morning. Um, this is um, Bob Thurman, and I want to talk to you today about the idea of loving your enemies. Loving your enemies is a very important teaching by Jesus and Buddha, particularly, although Muhammad actually and um, the great Hindu teachers also agreed with that, and the, the Taoists and Confucians in their own way agreed with that. But maybe the Confucian, there, you know, there were varieties among the Confucian, maybe the Mo, Moza, the Moists, did so more strongly than the than all the, some of the Confucians were a little more, you have to be tough with your enemies. Anyway, love your enemies is what I want to talk about today with you. And it's occasion because today is a day or two after the Charlottesville uh, riot caused by the neo-Nazi white supremacist um, Ku Klux Klan people who are part of Donald Trump's white hype, as it's called by political professionals, coalition, where they, they use the race paranoias of white people who feel they're losing their control of America and um, to people of color, immigrants, and so on. And um, they claim to be connected to Christianity, but that's not really the case. Because Jesus is the one who said, turn the other cheek, you know, and love your enemy, and, and to be hospitable to the stranger, and be the good Samaritan, and et cetera, et cetera. He was not at all one for violence. Jesus was against violence, as was Buddha, and all the great teachers of humanity. So, um, uh, that uh, occasion by that, and also I recently read a short article in the Atlantic magazine uh, about uh, some people called the Antifa movement, who are said to be the violent, those espousing violence on the left, if the white hype people are supposed to be um, espousing violence, you know, for the right, if that's considered right wing, you know, the, uh, the, the um, uh, neo-Nazis and people, then there's this Antifa who want to be violent and equal from the left, although they were not uh, formally involved, as far as I know, in the Charlottesville event. But um, I was disturbed by reading that, and um, so this is what I wanted to say today. I was inspired to speak to you today about loving your enemies. First of all, let me say, loving your enemies also doesn't mean, and, and even turning the other cheek, doesn't mean run out and find someone who doesn't like you and or ask them to hit you. It's actually when you can avoid them, kind of, they've already hit you once. And turn the other cheek, or when they ask you for your robe, you give them your cloak as well, your overcoat. And these are uh, where you surprise the expectation of the person who's already engaged with you in a hostile manner. And you don't lose your cool, and you don't become angry, and you don't operate out of hatred. You don't lose control to your, of yourself by operating out of hatred. And of course, the great Buddhist teacher Shantideva gave almost the best kind of technical psychology of how not to react like that. So... But I'm not, I don't want to just teach Buddhism here. I want to talk about this issue of violence and then violence and anti-violence and the whole concept of violence in our country today, which is uh, very unfortunate. And, uh, and it doesn't look like it can calm down because, in a way, violence won the presidency. You know, uh, President Trump got elected by being violent in his rallies and stirring up this kind of race hatred and race paranoia. And so he, he won't condemn it, or he wants to condemn sort of broadly and vastly everybody, all violence. Meanwhile, he wants to <laughs> nuke North Korea, but otherwise he's, he's broadly condemning violence. So to avoid condemning neo-Nazis, you know, we fought a major world war against Hitler. This country was part of a huge coalition involving the Russians, Chinese, uh, you know, who fought the ja Japanese, and the, you know, we fought the Germans and the and the Japanese and the Italians, 
They were, they were, so we, we fought fascism, in other words, enormously. So what are people doing walking in our street with Nazi flags and connecting it to the Confederate flag, which then promotes, which connotes slavery? And we have lots of millions and millions of wonderful, liberated black people who have made such wonderful contributions to America, who still have Jim Crow, New Jim Crow, you know, mass incarceration, all kind of dreadful things, bad education offered to them, uh, prison instead of education to the males, etc. I mean, this is unbelievable. And yet they are the best athletes, these wonderful singers, musicians, intellectuals, professors. I mean, they're amazing people. And this is ridiculous, something about them, whether they have a suntan or not. You know, multi-generation, genetically adapted suntan, or just sort of pale and pasty and blotchy and white like me, who gets sunburned, you know. <laughs> It's absolutely silly, and it's not us. And it, 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 but we don't have a president who will who, do, who will, you know, condemn that. It should be condemned. The law enforcement should be working on it and preventing them from organizing violent marches. And they shouldn't be given protest permits or march permits when they pledge violence. Permits should. I I don't know the rule the law, but you can't apply for a permit to go and do violence. You can go. You can peacefully march, but not do violence. If they had been peacefully marching and the Antifa people attacked them violently, that's another matter. And this is what the Antifa people are doing. And I hear that some people, quote, on the left, are condoning that and thinking that's somehow brave and good. And that's so wrong. That's what I want to talk about. So, but my point is, love the enemy doesn't mean go out and invite violence. But it means when violence is inflicted on you, don't respond violently. But it doesn't mean don't respond forcefully. There's a difference between violence and forceful. For example, to protect yourself with, a, with armor or with a shield or with your arms, that's you're being forceful and you're going to resist a blow or something forcefully. That's protecting yourself forcefully. It doesn't mean you're not counterattacking or preemptively attacking. That's not that's violent, not forceful. We have to be clear about these things. Now, some of the people in the article I read it said that the people who are calling for this antifa, following the lead of some extremists in Europe, are anarchists. And sure enough, when there are peaceful protests, like against the World Trade Organization, in famous one in Seattle and other ones regularly that are done, which are very humorous and marvelous, where people put it, dress up in turtle costumes, and, or, and they or sea, seagull, like oil dripping seagull costumes, and they do creative things like that to try to awaken people's conscience. That's fine. That's not violent. And language, they can say forcefully state things, state things, although violent speech also is unfortunate because it triggers physical violence. So it doesn't mean go out and invite violence, but it also doesn't mean freaking out and giving tit for tat and eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. Although in a way, even eye for an eye was once a, a level of relative nonviolence because it meant an eye, only an eye for an eye and not, the, not a leg and a, and a life for an eye. You know, it was a way of trying to stop revenge cycles. Even Moses' eye for an eye, you know. People don't realize that. They think that it was just condoning violence, but not, not really. It was trying to be talking about proportional response. Okay, so my point is this. A lot of them say they are anarchists. And before you heard of Antifa, they were gen tended to be hooded or masked, black-clothed anarchists at the Seattle one, for example, where they start smashing windows and disrupting uh, property burning cars and things like that. And actually, uh, observers and nonviolent protester type people like myself, we always associate that kind of people with agent provocateur, which means someone who's put in there by the oligarchy or the authoritarian group that is being protested against, and uh, to in order to discredit the peaceful protesters and to prevent them from achieving their aim, which is to awaken the conscience 
in a Gandhian forceful, nonviolent, but non-forceful but nonviolent type of resistance, uh, it, 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 it prevents them from achieving their aim because uh, the people then see some violence coming is associated with them and then they think it's just violent and they won't listen to it. They'll, they'll say, well, then that's not worthy of considering that there's something wrong being protested. The protesters themselves are wrong because they're violent, but they're not all violent. It's just those anarchists who do that. Now, anarchy is supposed to seem like, well, really great or we don't like governments. Everyone should just have their own say. But actually, unfortunately, anarchy you know, for example, the oligarchs today who back Trump are anarchists. They think the government is useless and no good. They're billionaire anarchists, but they are anarchists or what they call themselves libertarians. The Ayn Rand people are libertarians, anti-government people. But the problem with the, that kind of that right-wing anarchy or left-wing anarchy and as, violent, as of right-wing violence and left-wing violence, the problem with it is that it leads to tyranny. It leads to um, lack of democracy. It leads to repression and suppression is the problem. If you look at the pattern of civilizations like ancient China, when the anarchists get really strong and when, you know, dynasties decay and when they're, because the people, the, the, the rulers do not represent the people. The people have no stake in supporting the rulers because the rulers don't give them anything. They try to take everything away from them, enslave them all. In those periods, then anarchy ensues because the people say, we, why should we tolerate real rulers who are like that? But then the problem is that that, that does break down a dynasty, but the, what follows is it worse than the dynasty always. There you have Lenin and Stalin, the Russian Revolution. There you have Mao and what followed him. There you have all of these dictators who rise first initially seeming to stop a worse or corrupt group. But then they become empowered through violence and then they use that violence to suppress even more worse. Worse, to suppress even more the people who wanted liberation. So there's a cycle where anarchy leads to authoritarianism. And then eventually authoritarianism when opposed in conscience awakening, nonviolent ways, tends to then tends to shade into something that's where it's really for the people, by the people, of the people, and sometimes that can be monarchical, con the equivalent of constitutional monarchical, or ethical monarchical when there's no written constitution, where you're dealing in the old days with agricultural and mostly illiterate populations, and because why? Because the human being likes to get along with other human beings. They're happy when they're popular. They're happy when other people like them. We are happy and, and people like us when we do things with them and for them and communicate with them and are kind to them and think of their perspective on things. And we and, and sort of want them to be happy, which means to love them. And so that will ensue. It can never ensue out of anarchy because Anarchy is just so disor dis disorganized that there's not one source of oppression, but lots of them. So you can never get anything going like that. That love thing is uh, in small scale, but you, overall you can't control. So anarchy inevitably leads to tyranny, 100% tyranny. And like, you know, fascism, like, uh, like Hitler and so on. So the, you anarchists are thinking that you're anti-fa or against fascism are actually being a cause of fascism by responding violently to the violent white racist supremacist Ku Klux Klan, John Birch Society, National Rifle Association um, uh, type of people, you know, Nazi, neo-Nazi people. You're joining them actually in bringing on a, an authoritarian state. Uh, they, you know, they want it to be white. It doesn't matter whether it's white or purple or whatever it is, if it's totally fascists crushing people, it's bad, you know, and it doesn't, all races are capable of that kind of, we have Mugabe in Africa, for example, a horrible tyrant who originally was a liberator, he was part of a revolution, but a violent one against an oppressive system, and th so this is, that's the pattern of history is like that, yes, you should resist, yes, it is very important to resist, 
and forcefully but non-violently resist. Forcefully meaning perhaps civil disobedience, but never by attacking another, just sitting in the street, obstructing this, and then if they are going to run over you, get out of the way, of course. But if there's enough of you, it's hard for them to, to do that. And that's dangerous, even for nonviolent and forceful, but also violent and forceful is dangerous too. So, so this is what I wanted to say. The Antifa business is a very bad for liberals and for those of us who want to restore liberal democracy. And me, liberal there meaning, you know, wanting to, people to vote, giving them the franchise, wanting people who really want to come and be part of our society and immigrate to, to immigrate. Not to come in and make their own sub-society like a gang in our society or, or make, a, make a ghetto where they then don't integrate in with our society. We want them to integrate our society but in our society, it's can expand with integrating. They don't have to all speak English. We should have a Spanish sector in our society because actually a lot of our Western and Southwestern area, we stole in our history from the Spanish speaking people. And then the native people, that's a whole other story. And we really need to respect them in a new way. We've never apologized to them. There's been some, there's some movement toward apology about slavery and restitution for slavery. There has to be a lot more. But we are really hardly begun in regard to native people. We owe them so much. That's one reason it's hard to start because it's more than we think we can pay. So love your enemies. Is the way by loving your enemies you do conquer your enemies? If you're worried about being conquered by your enemies, the true way to conquer your enemies are loving them. In order to be able to love them, you have to conquer your inner enemy, which is your hatred. And hatred and anger, which take which takes you as its tool and its weapon, and you lose your self-control, and you'll kill your get yourself killed. You'll harm others. You'll like the like the guy who ran over the poor innocent woman and killed her in Charlottesville. He's also given up his life to stupidly do that. He, you know, he will die for having done that. So he's taken to his own life. That's suicide to do that, as well as murder. Okay? We don't charge him for suicide, but that is suicide, in one form or another. That's giving up his life. And it's bad, out of hatred and anger. So you have to conquer your inner enemy to love your enemy, your outer enemy. And then if you love your outer enemy, meaning you sincerely want that enemy to be happy, you want those stupid guys with the, who are confused and misled badly from the pre by, the, by their enablers from the president on down, you know, the alt-right sort of people, people who are not having a happy life so they think by torturing and attacking people of color they're going to have a happy life which is a delusion by attacking women and putting them in the in their place by attacking i don't know what anybody liberals they're going to be happy they're not they're very unhappy you can see that if they put that energy of going around and beating up people in charlottesville to go out and train to be an olympic runner we might have a few more successful white runners or to be a great basketball player. We might have a few high-paid basketball players, or football players. No, these guys are moving the energy going around going Heil Hitler against one of the worst enemies of our, our country and the world of those who want the individuals of the world to be empowered democratically. So, uh, so this, is the, this is the point I'm trying to make. We can criticize, and we rightly and should strongly criticize, our president for f failing to condemn uh, the means he's used to reach the presidency, inciting white racism and inciting violence against people of color and immigrants and so forth, and then now using the presidency with the uh, immigration, the ICE people and others to make violence against the, against the immigrants and undocumented people and young people and so on. And we should, and he should, turn make a turnaround now that he is president, or 
it's just a matter of time before he should be removed because he's no longer president. He's just a leader of a faction that is trying to take over our country with violence. And so he should condemn them and show that he's capable of redeeming himself from what he has been doing, which we, which, you know, we should criticize that. We should resist that. I'm not saying I expect him necessarily to do that, but maybe, who knows? The angels of America, of the angels of democracy, may be able to convince him in his dreams that he's uh, really barking up the wrong tree. Uh, so, so just as we do that, we then should not be condoning any sort of antifa or any sort of violent resistance to that. Because then that simply gives them more of an excuse. Then they feel righteous and they'll get stronger. We should realize that those who are violently oppressing or attacking the violent people are demeaning and ruining the movement of nonviolent revolution, of peaceful revolution, of loving revolution, which is what we have to have. Forceful, but loving and peaceful and nonviolent. That's, what, that's the only thing we can look for. That is what democracy is, actually. Democracy is a regular revolution, you know, such as Lenin could, or Mao could ever even dream of, where you have a revolution every few years in an election, by, by means of election. But that's a nonviolent revolution. And when it goes to violence, then people will want someone to suppress all sides. So those on the, our side, the liberal, freedom-loving people, to condone violence against the violent people who are overtly violent and have a philosophy of it, is our mistake. We are, it is helping, because they are not helping us, they are helping the people who are suppressing us. If they were not there, one of the strategies of the oppressor or fascist people is the false flag thing, or the agent provocateur thing, where they send out someone to pretend to be part of your group, your protest group, and then that person starts doing violence to bring down violent oppression upon the whole group, if you follow me. So this is, this is the key point, okay? That's all I wanted to say today, and love your enemy, and, that, and I love the Nazis, I love the white racists, I love them, I feel, I feel very sad for them, they're very unhappy, they are barking up, they're totally going to where they're getting themselves killed, they're being suicidal, they have no fun, they can shout and scream about Hitler or anybody that they want, or to Robert E. Lee, and that will not help them, and uh, they are ruining their lives, and I feel very, very sorry for them, and I love them, I want them to be happy. If they were happy, they'd be going to rock and roll concerts, and they wouldn't be going out and beating people up. So they'd be having fun, you know. They'd be having nice girlfriends who would like them because they wouldn't beat up, beat them up. Okay? So they'd be happy people. And that's what I want them to be. Then we won't have the problem with them. Okay? So that's a bit.